next speaker is going to be Henry. Um, Henry is going to be talking to us remotely today. Henry is a steward of the community-funded project, Babel. He hosts two podcasts, Hope in Source and Maintainers Anonymous. He's based in New York and likes Korean barbecue, ping pong, and board games. He works full-time in the intersection of technology and faith, primarily through open source. So please let us welcome Henry. Um, hello, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, thanks for having me. I know I wasn't able to make it in person, but yeah, I'm really excited for the opportunity and really happy to see um, just all the work that's being done in open source in Africa. Um, yeah, so today uh, the top of my talk is called Open Source at Face Value. Um, and just to introduce myself, yeah, I'm Henry. Uh, I work on the uh, Bow project. And then um, I'm on Twitter at left underscore pad. Um, yeah, so that's Pavel. Um, yeah, so first I'm going to just mention that this talk is going to be a little philosophical. Um, I'll start with what I, what, you know, how you might define face value, uh, to accept something as it appears, um, to not question it, to trust it, to not be skeptical. And in that way, it just means to have faith in something. And so you might be wondering if you want me, you want me to ask you guys to take this thing at face value or this talk at face value, but uh, I guess because I'm talking about it, maybe we shouldn't. Um, and so my point is that maybe we should be asking more questions. Um, you know, maybe the reason why we know things at all is because we're curious enough to ask these questions. Um, and so, you know, a scenario that I'm going to propose is that eventually someone will ask you, uh, what is open source? Um, a lot of my friends that are not necessarily in tech, they will eventually ask what is open source because they'll ask me, what do I do? And I say, I work in open source. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important for us to ask ourselves how we will be answer this question to someone that's unfamiliar with this. And so a lot of times to simplify, I might say something like, it's just Wikipedia for code. Um, and if your friend takes it at face value, then they'll be like, oh, that's cool. Then move on. And, um, but, you know, maybe they'll be more curious. And I think asking questions doesn't necessarily mean that we're skeptical, but just like how kids continue like to ask why all the time. I think that um, similarly for me, I think about how I got started in open source. Um, and it was because I was, there was a curiosity that I was being drawn towards certain clues. I wasn't even able to express why I wanted it or wanted to be involved at the time. But I definitely started with this question of who is behind the code. And maybe for Wikipedia, it might be who is behind Wikipedia, who's working on it? Who are these volunteers or people? Are they being paid or not? Um, I think this is the kind of question that led me on a journey to go from kind of being detached from open source, seeing open source as just this black box, to seeing it more in a personal way. And I think that led me to want to do it at work, uh, to become a maintainer, and ultimately quit my job to kind of do it full time um, without being at a company. Um, and so the, this the picture on the right is essentially the icons that you get when you make a GitHub uh, username, but you don't upload a photo. And so the point with this is just to say that a lot of times we don't really know who is working on the projects that we depend on. And so the question I think about now is why do we do open source? Um, maybe that's a better way of thinking about what open source is too. I think there's a lot of different reasons. We all have our reasons. For me, it's changed a lot over time. Um, and it's still difficult to explain at times. It feels like just saying a sentence uh, doesn't really tell you what it's really about. But I think it is a question that once you get more involved, especially if you're a maintainer and you get burnt out, you start asking yourself, why are you still doing this? Um, so if, to get a little bit philosophical, um, I try to see one way of thinking about this in terms of uh, different movements that we have in philosophy. And 
I might break these down into three parts, the pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. So pre-modern might be a free software, which is the first movement of open source uh, in the 1980s with Richard Stallman. And then 1990s, um, we had the advent of the open source movement. And then 2000s, 2008, we had GitHub. Uh, and say at 2018, we've had 10 years uh, of GitHub. And so I would consider myself as part of this quote unquote GitHub generation. Um, and so for me, in a way, pre-modern um, free software is, it could be seen as dogmatic or traditional. It's based on authority, on faith. And then with modern, uh, our faith turned to the enlightenment and this reason. And so we appeal to science and technology. In the postmodern age, there isn't really an authority. There's no story. We challenge all narratives at all. And so the equivalent in open source would be um, with free software that code should be free. This is probably best stated in the, the phrase free as in speech, not free as in beer. And in open source, it, it's more about that when we collaborate together, it, uh, open source software versus proprietary can be more efficient or effective. Uh, there's this Linus law quote, or given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow because it assumes that because it's open, everyone will be involved and help each other out. And with the GitHub generation, it's really just about scratching your own itch and sharing it. So kind of like I made something that helps me, but I figured I might as well help other people too. Code becomes more expressive. It's about art. You do you, right? Um, and I think doing some self-reflection, I, I think I'm in that last category. And so as we move to the next billion creators and GitHub talks about how they're going to have 100 million developers by 2025, we should be thinking about like, how do we think about open source? Why are we doing it? And do we even have like a shared vocabulary or even vision of where it's going? Um, maybe we are all taking it at face value, but in our own ways. You know, there's this story from David Foster Wallace that talks about how the fish don't really understand what water is because it's the water that they swim in. And so for us, it's similar to the culture that we're in. Sometimes it's hard to kind of step back and think about like, where are we? Um, and so one way of explaining this is a blog post that Steve Klabnik did um, called Culture War at the Heart of Open Source. And it resonated with me because when I read that the, the members of the movement no longer understood the ideology, I don't really know why the open source you know, came about or the history behind it until I had to look into it. I kind of just did it because I felt like it. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but in a way, the reason why we don't really understand how it works now is because because it succeeded. Um, a lot of times we talk about how open source has won. We say this a lot, maybe to, you know, almost too triumphantly. You know, what do we really win in winning open source? Okay, everyone uses it now. 99% of software uses open source, but what are the consequences of it? You know, is this how we want to measure our success, you know, with Babel or whatever project, how many stars we have, how many downloads we have. Um, it's similar at a project level scale too. All the numbers go up, but maybe we've lost something in the success, you know, because I think, again, we are losing this question of who is working on this. Just because your project is really popular doesn't mean that the maintainers are able to stay and sustain themselves, not just financially, but just like mentally or, or socially. And you might ask, isn't that the whole point? The, the point of abstracting people behind the code. We shouldn't have to worry about who works on open source. And that's exactly why it's successful. Um, we don't have to know who's working on it. And you don't want to deal with this idea of the cult of personality or having benevolent dictators. And so it, it's good that it just works. No one has to know. It's not really about individuals. But I think a lot of times we attempt to remove people um, from the equation, but uh, we find out it doesn't always work out. So I want to talk a little bit about, about abstraction. Um, you know, it's not all bad. It allows us to ask questions, to probe things. It's how software works at all, that it's all built on these layers of abstraction. Um, but I like to chat about how that can go wrong sometimes. And so abstraction hides information and open source in that sense hides our dependencies. Um, abstraction through hiding 
brings about this sort of distance between the code and ourselves. And code distances from people sometimes. And so and this you can apply this in many different ways. And if I want to bring in this food or even environmental ec ecological aspect to it, you know, distance can breed the ignorance of the ecosystems and the individuals and animal lives of the people that feed us. And I can apply this to to coding, you know, like distance between code removes us from the people that maintain the software that we use. You know, what happens when we buy food from a restaurant or we go to the grocery store um, or buy online? Do we, it, it, we don't really think about what goes into all that and the consequences of all that. And the same thing in open source. So that these systems of abstraction, which help us um, in our lives and are really great, also helps us um, in a way to forget um, how they work. And so I think this is kind of the difference between driving a car versus understanding it, using a library or code versus understanding it, let alone fixing it or even creating it from scratch. We, we refer to mechanics to fix our cars um, or maintainers to fix our bugs uh, rather than looking into and being curious about how things work. And it's not that we have to understand everything all the way down, but sometimes that's where kind of the entitlement comes in where like you, 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 you kind of push everything to other people. And in the end, you don't even make decisions. You kind of just consume. And so you know, this is kind of, you can summarize this through this, uh, this phrase or this law from Joel Skolsky that um, all non-trivial abstractions are leaky that they don't actually work when you know you see like the bugs in it um, but you can take it even further to show that all abstractions are leaky at some point it doesn't even have to be non-trivial um, and this phrase of the map is not the territory i think explains this really well another way to put it is the then the menu is not the meal or the word is not the thing uh, on the picture on the right it shows the mercator projection uh, of the map you know we're trying to take a 3d sphere and then show it in 2D and you can see how like at the top, like Greenland, Russia, they're a lot bigger in blue than they actually are in real life. Um, and this is just um, the map, right? It's different from how it actually is. And so in a way, maps actually distance us from the world too. Instead of exploring what's out there, you know, having a sense of serendipity, um, we kind of just go directly from A to B and we lose out on what's out there because we, we have to know exactly where to go. There's actually this funny story where, um, fictional story of an of a empire that they're trying to make a map that's so detailed that they end up making the map as big as the territory itself. And of course, the problem with that is that, you know, it's a one-to-one -one scale and then now it becomes useless because you don't need the map anymore. You might as well just use the territory. Um, and so I think applying that to programming, we could say the same thing that, you know, the program is not the same thing as the API or the docs, or even the types. Um, in a way, those things help, those are maps to understand the program. But if you don't actually look into the program and start understanding how it works, it's not really the same thing. And a lot of times we have this disconnect between the people that work on the program and the people that just simply use it. And we try really hard through these different ways. And these are, are good things to do. But a lot of times there's like this huge gap. And so I think, what I'm trying to emphasize again is that the people behind the program uh, matter. And in another way, I mean, this is kind of depressing, but you know, you know, a hundred percent test coverage will still have bugs. Standards can still have bugs. Working at the top companies, you can still have bugs, and all open source projects will also still have bugs. And this isn't to say that that's completely we can't do anything. Um, but these, these things are stuck in time and we need people to maintain all these things. We can't just uh, assume that they're all 100% correct. And so, yeah, I don't think we should give up. Um, I like this way that Bruce Lee actually talks about the stages of cultivation within martial arts and we can apply this to programming. So he, the first stage is the primitive stage where you kind of, when you're, when you're learning how to fight essentially, you don't really know what you're doing, but at least you're kind of yourself. And so I call that the yellow stage uh, we're in programming, we're just doing it and we're having fun. Eventually someone's telling you that you're not doing it right. 
And so they're like, oh, you should learn these techniques. And so you get into the mechanical stage. But at that point in time, you're very rigid in your thinking. It's kind of like when you learn a principle like dry, uh, don't repeat yourself. And you try to do that everywhere. Um, and then eventually in the third stage, you get to this point of artlessness. And then you realize when you should apply dry. Um, and you start saying it depends all the time. <laughs> but I think before, it, it's hard to know, like, you just feel like you have to do it all, at all times. And so I don't think that we should be completely cynical and skeptical that we should question everything. We have to make decisions at some point. We can't do things with certainty. We have to learn to basically take things on faith. We have to learn to commit and to risk. Um, and we can't only live by what our experience is. We do have to trust people and other things. Uh, one way of putting this is that all models are wrong, meaning that we cannot be completely certain, but some are useful, that we can truly know what to do. Um, so I would argue for confidence over certainty. And, and also, even from the article about food, uh, it's too easy to say that proximity is good and distance is bad, or that abstraction is all bad because it leads us in, in a bad direction if we take it too far. Abstraction is helpful and it's necessary for us to do software and, and live life. So I want to go into this um, essay called Programming as Theory Ability. And I think this relates to programming and people a lot. And so when you ask yourself the question, what is programming? A lot of people, the common notion is that programming is about making an artifact, a piece of code. But rather in this essay, it says that uh, programming is an activity where programmers create a model, a mental model or insight into how programs work. And so later it says that the essential, they think the essential part of programming is the theory of it and that it can't even be expressed, but is even bound into the being of people. And so that way it's actually inherently personal. It's living, it's dynamic. It's not detached, this objective thing out there. And I can say that it, this is applies well to writing or reading as well. You know, reading isn't about memorizing a bunch of statements or facts, but it's about how it changes how you see the world. A lot of times you read a book and at the end you're like, I don't actually remember anything from the book, but it has shaped how you see the world if it actually resonated with you. So what is open source? Um, I like this tweet that Shelly actually tweeted yesterday about how, you know, a lot of coding is not actually coding. And when, especially early on, um, you feel like you're not being productive if you're not writing any code. Well, I'd like to say that I'm a maintainer. I've been doing this for a while. I still don't feel productive when I'm not writing code. And I'm not even writing code that much at all these days. Um, we're, I'm doing a lot of different things as a maintainer that are not that. And, you know, it's not measurable as much. It's not as quantifiable. It's not easily as tweetable. Uh, the work takes longer. Maybe it's still just in your head. Um, and you want to feel like you're, you're getting somewhere. Um, and so maintainer, maintainers, I want to say, are not easily substitutable. There's a lot of different things in open source that many people have mentioned in previous talks about docs and tests and all these different things. Um, and our best attempts to replace ourselves with robots, right, it doesn't really work out. And we need kind of people. We need to think differently about how we transfer knowledge um, to more of a mentorship model versus just kind of broadcasting things and assuming that people will figure it out if they just read some docs. So I think that this doesn't mean we should put maintainers on a pedestal, uh, but I don't think it means that we should ignore them either. We shouldn't ignore people. So this is a big slide, but um, I like what Dan has to say. Um, one of his essays, he talks about how technology is a living product. We tend to think of technology as just the static thing you know, it's not, it's not living, right? It's just, it's dead. But he says that it should be practiced in order to be maintained. And he has, gives this example of the shrine in Japan where every generation, they actually tear down the whole building and they rebuild it again. And the reason why is because they want to preserve what is called the process knowledge of building that thing. They realize that it's not enough to, you know, write down a bunch of docs or an algorithm on how to build this the structure, but actually that the people themselves need to do it. And so I think this is emphasizing this, the importance of know-how. Um, you know, this dynamic between what is dead and living, what is static and dynamic, what is an artifact 
or what I would say in open source is infrastructure. It's being run. You know, it's de it's uh, not just detached, but it's personal. And I think that the digital realm gives us these superpowers. And if we feel like we can remove all our limits, um, we think that time can be frozen and there's no cycle of like um, life and death, but code can rot. Things must be repaired. And that's why we call ourselves maintainers, right? Things need to be updated. And so I think this is a great analogy that I like um, that in a complex system, you know, whether it's a city or an environment, open source, there's all these different variables that are hard to manage. It's not as simple as creating an algorithm. You know, what we're dealing with open source, you know, is it a cat or a toaster? And so what it means is that, is it a living thing or is it just a mechanical thing? You know, me mechanical thing, you can take a powder toaster and you put it back together. You wouldn't want to take apart a cat and put it back together. Uh, you wouldn't want to try to solve a cat, right? Um, and so in a similar way, I think that we tend to treat, you know, the city as just a bunch of buildings, the environment as just some resources, open source is just some code, but behind all those things are people, uh, living things that we should care about. And so in this sense, we should, we could think about the life, death and revival of programs. And this happens when people have to rebuild the theory behind the program itself. Um, and that programs can die when people don't understand how they work, even though the code can still run. Um, so I think it's important for us to think about that. And so the point here is that uh, I wanna say that it's important for us to not just question, uh, to just find solutions, but to figure out how to like love these questions that we're asking, to internalize our thinking, to embody it, to indwell what we're doing. Um, so for, in order for us to take open source at face value, I think we should learn to live out what that means, uh, to live our way into this answer. Cause a lot of times we don't really understand what we're doing and I definitely am still figuring it out too. So I'd say, you know, if you're getting started in open source to ask questions, to talk to people, look at the source dialogue with maintainers, um, you know, get involved, um, and make relationships. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Lefpad on Twitter, and maybe I can figure out how to stick around online if you want to chat after. Uh, thanks. All right.